Hello, and welcome back to Early Global Cultures. I'm Professor Amy Young, and today we'll take a look at the High Middle Ages. But first, I'm curious what you think. Do we live in a dark age? In order to evaluate this, we should reconsider what the dark ages were really about. Maybe you remember that things were uncertain then, that people were struggling to make ends meet. They feared invasion and attack, and they relied upon superstructures like the church and the state to offer guidance and protection. Plus, there was a regression in culture, at least as far as interest in learning and arts were concerned. I mean, it wasn't as though all models of learning and art had been lost, right? I mean, they had examples. They had access to great works of the past. Learning was possible. It just wasn't a priority. So what do you think? Is there anything similar going on now? Do we make the most of our gifts? We have seemingly limitless knowledge and capability at our fingertips, but are we using it to better ourselves? To create and express what it means for us to be human? Or are we stagnating, waiting for inspiration, waiting for the chaos around us to calm down so we can have faith in our own abilities again? I must have asked this question in a hundred classes, and the answer is always different, but at the very least, hopefully, it gets you thinking about what you're making of the age you've got, be it dark or brilliant. Today in Early Global Cultures, we'll work to understand the historical and philosophical context of Middle Ages Paris, and we'll look at High Middle Ages expression there in Gothic cathedrals and the music of Notre Dame. In addition to that, we'll explore the resurgence of education and philosophy in this era. And while we're doing all of that, see if you can spot what's changed in this culture. What's taken the place of fear and chaos? And where did this change come from? In this era, Paris is the center of Western arts and innovation. It's the royal seat of the Frankish kingdom and it has a strong mercantile center. So civilization is springing back to life here. Plus, they're innovating arts and music. Gothic architecture is born here, a form of architecture that remains popular even today. And in these newly designed cathedrals, music has a distinctly different flavor. Furthermore, learning, which had been a big deal since the time of Charlemagne, expands beyond just literacy into full-blown philosophical exploration. Thinkers work to understand ancient philosophical texts. Universities are established and a new school of thought called scholasticism tries to marry theological belief with reason and logic. Overall, the Judeo-Christian worldview is newly expressed, moving away from the Dark Ages message of fear and into a message that offers more hope for humanity. And one way that that change is manifest in this era is with the rise of charters and guilds where people once relied upon the agrarian feudal system to offer protection and sustenance, they started to find themselves amid re-emerging urban centers, and they no longer wanted their efforts and prosperity to be tied to the king's wishes. Towns wanted to become incorporated, and trade towns began to assert their independence with town charters, protecting their interest outside of feudal demands. Also, with the rise of trade and urban life, guilds are formed for nearly every sort of handicraft or urban necessity. Guilds worked together to control trade, to set prices, and to train youth, ensuring the quality of their craft and preventing competition and undercutting. Guilds also offered amazing benefits to their members, taking care of them when they fell ill or suffered misfortune, and setting work hours and standards of pay. There were even levels of organization within the guilds themselves. In order to become a member, you must first start as an apprentice and simply watch and learn while taking care of menial tasks. Then you would move up to a journeyman where you could take part in some of the craftsmanship, but your work still had to be approved to be considered complete and up to guild standards. And if you made it through that level, you would be considered a master, someone who was an expert and was responsible for the training and approval of guild crafts. A work that had been created or approved by a master was called a masterpiece. As collective bodies, guilds were pretty powerful. They knew their value in the newly formed trade towns, and they made sure that their voices were heard as they vied for recognition of their political aims and interests. 
Does this sound familiar to anything we still have today? If you're thinking yes, then you're right. The, the same sort of system still exists in the form of labor unions today. But it wasn't just labor and trade that were changing. The look and feel of the church was changing too. And this all started at the Abbey Church of St. Denis. The Abbey Church of St. Denis was a pilgrimage destination. For one thing, it housed some of the relics of St. Denis, the patron saint of France. St. Denis was an early Christian martyr who's said to have been beheaded for his beliefs, but even after his so-called execution, it's rumored that he picked up his own head and went on preaching the gospel. This is why, in France, you may see images of a dude holding his own head at religious locations. The Abbey Church was also built during the Carolingian dynasty, and it was a burial place for some of the Frankish royal family. Its royal lineage and legend made it a major attraction in Paris, so it needed to be renovated to accommodate a growing number of pilgrims. Plus, it it had also become a meeting place for annual trade fairs, so a facelift was in order. The man who pushed for innovating the church was Abbot Suget. Suget had been educated in a monastery school, and he also served as regent of France while the king was away on the Second Crusade. Suget had big ideas, and he didn't just want to rebuild and enlarge the church, he wanted to make it the spiritual center of France. He wanted a church to match the grandeur of the Hagia Sophia, and he brought in craftsmen from all over Europe. The result was the beginning of the Gothic style, a style that would take off in the High Middle Ages and be admired for centuries afterward. So here it is, the Abbey Church of Saint Denis as it was reimagined in the 12th century. You can see where he's added room around the central nave to accommodate more pilgrims, but how is this different than the churches we've seen before? How does it break from the Romanesque tradition? What is your eye drawn towards? And what effect do you think this might have on a pilgrim visiting this church for the first time? The style of Suget's church was called Gothic. Now you may remember the name Gothic had a negative connotation and those that called this style Gothic wanted to denigrate it. They preferred the Romanesque style and they thought this style was barbarous or rude. Nonetheless, the Gothic style stuck around and it has some very distinct features, all of which help build vertical interest. In fact, Gothic churches went higher and higher competing with each other to see how tall they could get. And they kept going until Bouvet Cathedral collapsed in on itself during construction. Presumably, they found the limits of the design there. One of those helpful vertical features, though, was the use of the pointed arch. You may remember we saw pointed arches in Islamic architecture, and Christians adopted them here because pointed arches create downward thrust, enabling them to bear more weight and accommodate new heights in construction. With pointed arches came ribbed vaults. This replaced the barrel and groin vaults fashioned from rounded Roman arches and it made it possible to use lighter materials. When you look up at Gothic ceilings, you'll see the crisscross of pointed arches or ribs created there. Another innovation was the flying buttress. Instead of using the heavy stone buttressing that pressed right up against the church walls like they had in Romanesque architecture, designers here moved those buttresses away from the church walls, connecting them with half arches or flyers. This is another feature that allowed them to build churches taller, but perhaps more importantly, it filled up the wall space for windows, and with that came stained glass. Gothic churches used stained glass to share pictographic and symbolic religious messages. Rose windows, for instance, were a symbol of divine geometric perfection, and other windows provided narrative art and messages to church visitors. Finally, reducing the weight of the church construction materials made it possible to have taller walls that carried the eye heavenward inside, and outside, spires and pinnacles pointed heavenward too. Those points not only reminded the visitor of heaven, but they also resembled a crown, paying homage to the royalty of the land and the majesty of God. Here's an example of a cathedral that was completed from the start with the Gothic style in mind. Can you see the Gothic elements? There are those pointed arches all along the nave and the ribbed vault that makes up the crisscross ceiling. The lighter frame allows for a lot more glass and interior light. And there at the heart of the altar, you see that they've included a rose window. 
And while all of this is very pretty, it also has some important philosophical messages embedded in the design. Stained glass becomes a Bible for the poor and illiterate. And Xu Zhe himself said that stained glass was meant to show simple folk what they ought to believe. Not only that, but the colorful glass provided pilgrims a jewel-like focal point upon their arrival. And that must have been a beautiful and welcome sight after a long and arduous journey. And there was more still to this innovation. It wasn't just pretty pictures. It was religious mysticism in the form of light. You may remember that mysticism involves a physical, ecstatic experience with the divine, and Suge had read about mystical theology. He'd also read Plato, and if you remember, Plato had ideas about ideal forms and light. The sun or the light in his allegory of the cave representing knowledge or enlightenment, for instance. With these two ideas combined, Suge asserted that this light, or lux nova, was the physical and material manifestation of the divine spirit. The closer one could get to the light, the closer one could get to God. So let's, let's think about this for a second. Where have we seen light before? It was an allegory of the cave, sure, but wasn't it also important at Stonehenge? And also in Egypt? And how about the Pantheon? It seems like light's been a pretty important idea for a really long time. And religious imagery and light may have also had some interaction in the Byzantine era, too. There was that halo of windows in the Hagia Sophia, and the gold mosaics on Byzantine church walls, when illuminated by candlelight, must have looked especially ethereal and divine. But with that mosaic imagery, the light was reflected light. It bounced off the divine image, and maybe it touched you, the viewer, in that way. But here, in the Gothic cathedral, the light comes through the image. It comes through the image and it touches you directly. I wonder how this might have felt different for the pilgrim. Gothic sculpture also has a different philosophical message. It was not as dark as the Romanesque imagery was, and often churches saw sculpture as an opportunity to expand the knowledge and insight of worshipers. The imagery here was no longer about damnation, but was instead about redemption. Sculptural figures were weightier and more naturalistic, and very often they included messages about the importance of learning and compassion. They do still have a few grotesque sculptures in the form of gargoyles, but gargoyles have a symbolic meaning too. Some say they're meant to frighten evil spirits away from the church or that they signified evil fleeing from the church. Practically, though, gargoyles are often just gutters or water spouts, directing water away from churches that were often constructed of very porous limestone. And one other philosophy that made its way into Gothic architecture was the adoration of the Virgin Mary, sometimes called the Cult of the Virgin. Most Gothic cathedrals built at this time were dedicated to Mary, and as such they were called Notre Dame, which means Our Lady. The churches are distinguished from one another by including their location along with the names such as Notre Dame de Paris or Notre Dame de Chartres or Notre Dame de Lyon, etc. But the focus on Mary indicates another important shift at this time. Mary is the Holy Mother. Now, presuming you like your mother, what are some things that come to mind when you think about her? Maybe compassion? Warmth, nurturing, kindness, nourishment, protection. The word has some pretty strong connotations. And these are the connotations the church wanted visitors to feel when they visited the Notre Dame. Here's an example of a stained glass window honoring Mary at Chartres Cathedral. Can you see any Gothic elements here? I mean, besides Mary being a pretty big deal there in the center. That's right, the window's frame is a pointed arch, so the style is not just in the construction of the cathedral, but it's echoed throughout the church's decor as well. And a lot of work went into the creation of these windows. They were expensive and difficult to make. They're created by heating ash and sand to make glass, then powdered oxides were added to molten glass to create color. The pieces were assembled and glued together with molten lead. 
and the fine details were painted on once the whole thing had been secured in an iron frame. Shark Cathedral has some 176 stained glass windows, and many were donated by patrons hoping to show their devotion to the church, or in some cases, to gain favor as benefactors amongst the community. And here's an example of Gothic exterior sculpture at Shark Cathedral. What do you notice is Gothic about this one? How is it different than that Romanesque tympanum we examined in the early Middle Ages? Yep, there's that pointed Gothic arch. And can you tell who's in the middle? That's right, it's the Virgin Mary holding the baby Jesus. The figures are weightier and more realistic. Mary is surrounded by angels instead of demons, and the archivolt surrounding the tympanum, there are symbols of education and liberal arts there. Under Mary are scenes from the life of Mary and Jesus, but can you tell what's happening on that lowest register? Remember, this is the first thing pilgrims would see upon entering the church. That looks like a dead body, right? But it's not. It's Mary. She's just given birth to Jesus. She's just given the gift of Jesus to the world. How about that for an invitation? Here's another example of sculpture at Chart. The cathedral was originally Romanesque in design, but later it was revitalized in the Gothic style. The sculptures to the left are Romanesque. They're stiff, elongated, attached to the wall, and not terribly naturalistic. And the sculptures to the right are Gothic. They're pulled slightly away from the wall, and they're weightier, more like real people. Plus, they have individual stances and expressions, so they're more naturalistic, too. And here's one more Gothic sculpture from Amiyan Cathedral. The figure of Jesus, or our beautiful Lord, is on the trimo, or that middle column that separates two doorways. Notice that he, too, is weightier and more naturalistic, greeting and blessing pilgrims as they walk into the welcoming arms of the church. And if we look closely, we can see that there is a model of the Gothic church crowning him too, further illustrating the idea that redemption and peace may be found there. Now, these cathedrals didn't just change architecture and the message of the High Middle Ages church, they changed the whole High Middle Ages community. A cathedral belongs to the city or town in which it's located. Their urban constructions and social centers Religion, piety, and learning are no longer isolated like they were in monasteries. Cathedrals were a point of civic pride. Not only that, but cathedrals served a social function. Cathedral squares became central gathering points in the high Middle Ages towns, and people arranged their lives around the cathedral. Like a town courthouse, the cathedral exemplified social control, but it was even more integrated into people's lives. Babies were baptized there. Folks were married there, some were educated there, some found social welfare there, and in the end, many were buried there too. The cathedral became an aurarium for the people in that it ordered and organized their lives in the way that the aurarium did for monastic life. Church bells set the course for the day, and the observance of feast days and worship days became major events. And on top of all of this, the cathedrals had a tremendous economic impact. They attracted pilgrims and hosted trade fairs for their communities, and jobs were created in their design and construction. Masons, sculptors, stonecutters, and glassmakers were hired from all around. Guilds and nobility made lavish donations to advertise their generosity or sell their wares. It was a massive undertaking, and lots of people benefited. I kind of like to think about it like uh, when a town decides to build a new sports arena. It costs a lot of money, but it creates jobs, it attracts visitors, and ultimately, it gives them something to be proud of and something to rally around. In the end, though, the cathedral is a combination of human knowledge and religious faith. It's a demonstration of extreme technical achievement, yes, but it's not lacking in mysticism and religious interest. And here's what they ended up with. This is the Notre Dame chart. See how large it looms over this town? Clearly, it was an important feature in Middle Ages life there. And if you look closely, you can see its pinnacles, its rose window, its flying buttresses, and its pointed arches too. 
And eventually, this evolved into a style called Radiant Gothic. This is Saint Chapelle in Paris. It's not a cathedral, it's a chapel, but here you can see just how ornate this Gothic style became. It was originally next to the royal castle, and the chapel was a personal retreat for the king. Really, though, it's an enormous reliquary, as it's said to house a portion of the crown of thorns, retrieved from the east in the Crusades, and later purchased by King Louis IX. In this church, the edifice almost entirely disappears as the walls are taken over by stained glass. Each window depicting a book of the Bible. The viewer reads them from bottom to top, their eyes slowly raising heavenward. And then, at last, they make their way to the otherworldly stars that decorate the ribbed vault, transporting them completely away from the material world. Here's proof that you can't help but look up. This is me reading one of those books of the Bible in stained glass. But arts and architecture weren't the only things changing in this era. Music was making some bold moves, too. At the Musical School of Notre Dame in Paris, composers and musicians were playing with organum, counterpoint, and motet. Here, church musicians began experimenting with the plain chant sound, and the polyphony of organum was born. This style of music added at least one additional voice or melodic line to the plain chant line so that multiple notes were being sung simultaneously. For the most part, this began as improvisation, but it was gradually incorporated into religious chant, and eventually, Leonin, a master singer at the time, started to record the improvisations in a text called the Magnus Liber Organi, or the Big Book of Organum. Over time, more and more voices and melodic lines were added, many of them working against the plain chant line in what's called counterpoint, or against the note. Additionally, this style became melismatic, adding several additional notes per syllable in a stark departure from Gregorian pneumatic style. I've included a link to Alleluia Navitas online, and if you listen to it, you'll notice that it takes the singers almost a full minute to sing one word because they've added so much melisma. Another musical innovation was the use of the motet for religious purposes. A motet is a musical piece that is designed for three or more voices, and sometimes these voices may even be singing different songs simultaneously. Voices were interwoven with the tenor holding the original plain chant line. Tenor comes from the word tenere, meaning to hold, incidentally. O Matissima is an example of this type of religious motet. Give it a listen online and see if you can sense what Middle Ages listeners might have felt when they heard it. This music, unlike Gregorian chant, was less concerned with relaying the text clearly and more concerned with enhancing the listener's experience. Its goal was to uplift and please the senses as one contemplated religion, and this was yet another departure from the Dark Ages ethos of order and stability. Not surprisingly, church authorities who objected to the innovations thought worshippers would go crazy from the riot of voices and the mincing of notes. Regardless, the human condition was no longer resigned to be miserable. Individual sensory experiences were important again. Capability and contribution were worthy again. And in the High Middle Ages, people once again became interested in education, too. The new complexity of urban life created a demand for an educated class. In city centers, administrators, lawyers, and bureaucrats needed to be educated, and the reintroduction of ancient intellectual and cultural insight, preserved by Muslims and brought back from the Crusades, needed to be examined. All of this gave rise to universities. While there were universities in Spain, Germany, and Italy, the University of Paris was perhaps the most famous university in the High Middle Ages. Students would come from all over Europe to hear lectures by its instructors, but universities were organized slightly differently then. They were actually sort of a guild. The universitas or collegia were groups of students with common interests, and they were taught by magistry or masters and doctors. Those teachers were those that had proved themselves to be expert in various educational fields. 
The university was governed by faculty who had a guild and a charter, and they worked like a guild to monitor the quality of teaching at the school. Learning was slightly different too, though maybe not too much. I don't know. I'll let you decide. For Middle Ages students, Latin was mandatory, and students were able to choose from theology, liberal arts, or law as their preferred field of study. In class, they would receive some instruction from the masters, but mostly they learned via dialectics or the dialectal method, which you may remember was that method of questioning and disputation that Socrates was so fond of. With this method, they worked to develop logical theories and arguments, and they would have long discussions in an attempt to reach logical answers to philosophical questions. After about three to five years of study, students would be granted a bachelor's degree if they passed their final oral exam. Then they might go on to teach after their bachelor's until they'd proved themselves experts in their field, earning a master's degree. And for some fields of study, they could even add on another four years of education to earn a doctorate after defending an original thesis. Sound familiar? Yeah, not, not much has changed with that part of the system. And student culture and lifestyles are kind of similar too. Books were expensive and in short supply. Remember, there were no printing presses, so books had to be copied by hand, and student food and lodging were pretty terrible. Plus, they had a rigorous daily schedule. The day usually began at 5 a.m. with study, and then they'd go to lectures before heading off to group debate, and then they'd squeeze in some time for even more study before bedtime. They did have some fun, though. Students in this period invented a saint. It's not uncommon for guilds to adopt a patron saint, but theirs was entirely fictitious. Saint Goliath was the patron saint of wandering scholars, and students wrote songs and poems in his honor called Galardic Verse. Mostly these were drinking songs or songs about lost love or hard times, and sometimes they were obscene or sexual, so yeah, not much has changed there either. Unfortunately, not many women were able to participate in this growing support for education. Instead, women were educated by private tutors or in convents, but there were exceptions. For instance, women were allowed to study at the University of Bologna, and many female scholars found refuge there. And here's a depiction of the typical classroom at the University of Bologna. There's the master instructing the class. I really dig his chair and I kind of want one for myself. And if you look closely, you can see those front row students diligently following along. Then a little further back, others are chatting, distracted, and there's even one sleeping on the edge of his bench. And education and religion fell in love with each other when they met Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas had studied at the University of Paris, and he was acquainted with scholasticism, that philosophical school of thought that worked to prove theological points using ancient Greek methods of logical reasoning. What Aquinas was looking for was a balance between fideism and rationalism. Fideism asserts that religious faith is absolute and indifferent to efforts of human reason, and rationalism counters that everything, faith included, must be analyzed rationally, using reason. What Aquinas figured was that God gave human beings two paths to divine truth, reason and faith. In his masterwork, Summa Theologica, he uses the intellectual tradition of Aristotle to prove religious truths. Overall, the work was not meant to discover new knowledge, but rather it strove to reconcile old knowledge that may otherwise have seemed contradictory. In the text, a question was set forth for analyses. Then a discussion summarized arguments for and against the question, usually citing the Bible or church fathers, Aristotle, or even other thinkers. Finally, a solution was offered, reinforced with support from religious and secular authors. All in all, Summa Theologica aims to mirror a systematic and logical debate. In the work, Aquinas debated things like the nature of law, the authority of the state, the definition of life, and even the proof of God's existence. Eventually, Summa Theologica was adopted as a sort of handbook for the beliefs of the Catholic Church. And in case you're curious, yes, the University of St. Thomas in Houston is named after this guy. So here's an example of what he's doing in Summa Theologica. The question he's asking here is, is God a body? 
One argument says, it seems that God is a body because he has three dimensions. In the book of Job, it says, he is higher than heaven, and what wilt thou do? He is deeper than hell, and how wilt thou know? The measure of him is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. So there are measurements there. A counter argument, however, is said that God is a spirit, and that's from the Gospel of John. So those seem contradictory. The resolution, however, comes by way of reason. Aquinas deduces that it is absolutely true that God is not a body. His reasoning is that no body is in motion unless it be put in motion. And since God is the first mover, he is himself unmoved. This reasoning has its basis in Aristotle's ideas about motion and Christian belief about the nature of God. So what do you think? Does this method of argumentation make sense? Did Aquinas prove his point? No matter how you feel about him, Aquinas was certainly attempting to inject intellectualism into Christian thinking, and that bold move was something that had been missing for a minute. And another thing that I've been missing for a minute was a focus on goodness and compassion. And those philosophies were reinvigorated in the high middle ages by St. Francis of Assisi. Francis of Assisi was born wealthy, but at one point he went off to war. And while there, he had a vision that so moved him that he decided to give up his worldly life, his wealth and live in poverty and anonymity. In his new mission, he focused on the humanity of Christ reading the Gospels as a guide to living his own life. In fact, it's said that Francis meditated on the crucifixion so devoutly that he miraculously bore the stigmata, or the wounds, that Christ received when he was crucified. Francis also loved the created world, and he preached that all of creation was a gift from God, and we should care for it and admire it as such. Over time, he would become a saint closely associated with nature, There were even stories that he would preach to the birds, and today you may see statues of him in people's gardens. For Francis, the closer one got to God's creation, the closer they got to God. He preached with this focus all his life, relying upon the kindness of others to sustain him, and eventually gathering followers, all of them attracted to his simple message and lifestyle. While neither of them is necessarily better than the other, Francis certainly offers an emotional counter to the rationalism of Aquinas. And that is a quick look at the high middle ages. Things are looking better, right? People are investing in arts and education again, and the human experience is no longer wholly suppressed by fear. I hope you, like the folks in this era, saw some beauty in their rediscovery of human expression. Until next time.